How does a great team, especially one at home, get bowled out for 46? It turns out quite easily and quickly, I suppose. But we wanted to dissect what happened because this is obviously not normal. Now, India have been flirting with being rolled out cheaply at home for a long time now. But today they made sweet, sweet love to that low total. And of course, there were many factors like the toss, great catches, ideal bowlers, a wacky pitch that all came together to kill off this Indian innings. But consider me the coroner of Duxville, and this is your autopsy. Support us on Patreon and help us keep making our content. Join for exclusive perks like the AMAs, the live calls, and to chat with me directly on Discord. You can also enjoy ad-free content, early podcasts, and access to my emailer. Rohit decided quite a while back now that tricky pitches should be treated with disdain. None of this poking around. He wanted to show everyone that he was still boss, even on a wicket which decided otherwise. So we saw him try and play an on the up drive to a ball that maybe wasn't quite ideal. Fine, but that delivery jags back in. It might have even beaten a normal defensive shot, although we'll never know that because of the loose drive he actually played. But I reckon about this time he also thought he probably should have bowled first. But the truth is that even if he thought the ball would move around a little bit, no one expected this. There is tough for the first hour wickets, which is probably what Rohit assumed this would be, and there is 46 all-out wickets, which no one thought was possible. Captain Hindsight has never made a mistake, but India got this wrong, and the wrong never stopped. Because it wasn't just seam, it was bounce. Virat got a ball that not only bounced enough to hit his glove, but also seemed back. He got the combination ball. It was the best wicket ball of the day. And then you have to add some luck in, because that ball went straight at the leg side catcher. If he had been at leg slip, or been at leg gully, or been a step back, Virat survives. But like Goldilocks, New Zealand got it just right. Talking about catches, what about Safras Khan? He seemed to come out to the middle without his feet. A lot of us are fascinated to see how he'll go when the ball is zipping around from seamers. Well, I'm not sure we know after today, because that was not an innings. That was a man accidentally walking out to the middle at the wrong time. But it also took a pretty special Devon Conway catch to finish him off. The first of many. But luck plays a part as well. Jaiswell had probably been as good as anyone on this wicket so far, and he got a wide short ball, and he tried to hit it to the rope. That is what you are supposed to do. But he found Ajaz Patel and was gone. And on wickets like that, there is a theoretical discussion to be had, whether it's better to go out to a great ball or trying to hit a poor one. It is the if a tree falls in a forest of our game. But really, it sucks to be out on a shit ball on a shit wicket. Let's be honest. That ball did not have his name on it. If anything was written on it, it said, hit me. But on days like this, there is always a lucky wicket. The thing is that the next one also looks like luck. And it is, don't get me wrong, it's a strangle down the leg side. But it also came from the fact that that ball kept seeming until the 28th over. When the hell does that ever happen outside of a Duke's ball? If this ball had gone dead straight, Carroll gets enough bat on it to pick up runs. But the seam movement actually makes the edge behind. It's still not a good ball and there's still a little bit of luck there, but the conditions played a part. What about Fluke? Because this is the second wicket in a row from a ball down the leg side. You do not expect to see a team bowled out for 46 and have two dismissals down the leg side like this. But it was also caught on the offside. And that is weird, right? And of course, that comes in part from the seam movement. But if you were simply turning an average ball up, not even an average ball, but a bad ball down the leg side for one, you don't expect to be caught in the ring on the offside. There has to be an element of fluke to that. But there is also something else here at play. New Zealand bowled brilliantly. They swung the ball, they seamed it, O'Rourke and Henry got really nice bounce, they were aided by the cooler conditions going on and off the field, like lots of things went in their favour, plus of course that spicy pitch. But the last three wickets I just mentioned are from shit balls. Of the 191 deliveries that New Zealand offered, I would say these are definitely in the bottom 5% and probably quite low down that list as well. And when Jadeja is out, India is 34 for 6, and half the wickets are from their worst deliveries. That too, after New Zealand had dropped, maybe their easiest catch of the day, and there had been the very smallest, very microest of comebacks that was thwarted by a long hop and two balls down the leg side. But it's okay, because even when this was going to happen, the Indian lower order will save them. Because the Indian lower order always saves them. We have done a video on how the Indian lower order consistently saves them. And on this particular occasion, the Indian lower order did not save them. Ashwin got a brute of a ball that bounced up first, and you can see how low his hands are and how high the ball was. 
Usually when he comes in, the ball is starting to soften a little bit. And he quite often has to do a little bit of clever batting, whether it be, you know, take down the opposition spinner or handle some good seam bowling. But the ball is starting to be in his favor and the sun is starting to come out. That was not happening when he was batting today. I mean, he literally walked out there and the first ball he faced just sprung up at him and broke his bat. That's not a good first ball. And then you have the end, really, of this innings. Richard Park was so confused by this pitch that at one point he tried a reverse pull shot off his thumb. That he made 20 runs and was the last batter out there just tells you how quickly and madly this all happened. And for him, weirdly enough, this was not even the worst part of his day. And this wicket was well earned by New Zealand because they bowled a lot of very normal deliveries like this that just hadn't got the edge, and this one did. From there, it was just the tail. Left to handle the conditions that were clearly getting easier even as they were batting. Had New Zealand not got one of their luckier wickets or not taken one of the many great catches, the batting would have, you know, fought back. Instead, it was Kuldeep Yadav who was left confused as what he should do when batting with Mohamed Siraj. And of course, I don't want to suggest that this has nothing to do with the New Zealand team, even if there was a little bit of fluke and some bad balls that got the wickets, because they bowled incredibly. And think about their seamers. They have a swing bowler, a bounce bowler, and a seam bowler. On a day when the ball hooped around early under clouds, bounced way higher than it normally would, especially for a wicket like this, and seemed for way longer than you would almost ever see on Indian wickets. Or really, as I said before, anywhere not using a duke. And New Zealand had a perfect weapon for each one of those conditions. That's pretty handy. I mean, especially as this game was essentially played under New Zealand clouds with an England pitch and the odd Australian random freak bit of bounce. I mean, no wonder India kept hitting the ball in the air. But we do have to talk about that as well, because of those catches. New Zealand took two one-handed hangers out in the field. And at one stage, Matt Henry ran, I don't know, seven kilometers to take a wicket from a short ball. And twice, the Indians were caught with balls that easily could have just fallen short or not quite made it. New Zealand had one of those days where all the half chances were full chances, and they were taken chances. It reminded me a lot of when Stuart Broad killed Australia at Trent Bridge or the pink ball torment of India in Adelaide. Sometimes all the plays and misses just end up in catches and all those slashes that on another day would just go past the fielder, go straight to them. And once that happens, you then have the panic of the collapsing change room that just compounds all of it. And when you have a low score like this, especially with an Indian top order that's been flirting with low scores for a long time, everyone wants to talk about how bad they were. No one ever wants to talk about the freak hurricane that has occurred to make a total of 46 to a fantastic team actually happen. And think about everything that did actually go on. It had to rain for like more than a day. The toss had to go horribly wrong. There was movement in the air and from the pitch and the ball had to just bounce randomly in an un-Indian way at times. And all the half chances had to go against them. And even after all of that, you still had the fourth, fifth, and sixth wickets come from shit balls. Today, the right toss, pitch, cloud, and catch situation meant that 46 all out happened. This is the coroner's verdict. I have a book out with Abhishek Mukherjee, and it is called Overthrowing Cricket's Empire. And it's about the stories of how each team beat England for the first time. We go all the way back to the demon Fred Spotheth getting annoyed at WG Grace for acting a little bit like Alex Carey. And then we come all the way to present times with Rashid Khan's England's Redemption. We cover every single team to beat England in a major international, but we also talk about the incredible stories like the barefoot basher from Fiji that almost played for New Zealand. In fact, this book is full of tales like that. Like how Pakistan lost a top batter after he was on the run from an angry husband of a movie star he was having an affair with. And also how one future captain of his nation realized he might have to go out and bat at Lords and that he didn't own his own pads. Cricket was used as a tool by the empire, but what happens when those nations grow up and get good at it? Find Overthrowing Cricket's Empire on Amazon today.